Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Our first hymn this morning is number 363, All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name. O oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. For he is, our, he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Dear Lord, we ask your blessing and honor worship service today. May the things that we say, the hymns we sing, the reading of your word, and the prayers of our hearts all be to your honor and glory. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. Warm welcome to everyone today, another beautiful, warm, sunny day. Uh, as you're probably aware, uh, Ellen and I just got back from Italy a couple weeks ago, and uh, as we were grateful that Reverend Marianne was able to cover for the three weeks we were there, and, uh, and you think it's warm here, it was uh, in the high 30s every day, it hit 40 some days in Italy, and uh, air conditioning's not big on their, on their, <laughs> on their agenda. They're there, but they're very expensive to use. Um, and so you, you adopt siesta. So from about 12.30 every day, you just shut the day down until about 3.30, 4 o'clock when it's a little cooler, and then you go jump in the pool and get on with life. So it's a bit different here, and we're, so we're really enjoying the summer weather coming back. Um, also, uh, uh, Reverend Mary, I mean, actually, Office Mary Ann gave me a, the okay that I could ditch the jacket last week, so I'm uh, now into summer mode officially. So thank you, Mary Ann. Couldn't do it without her permission. 
Uh, a death announcement here, unfortunately. Uh, you'll see it on page five. We extend our love and sympathy to Debbie Hutchinson on the death of her mother, June Carolyn Bridge, on Monday, June the 11th, 2022, at the Lanark Lifestyles Retirement Residence in Perth. A service in memory and celebration of June's life is being planned for a later date. And arrangements are entrusted to the Irvine Funeral Home. Please remember Debbie and her brothers, Derek and Trent Hutchinson, and their families in your prayers. And we will be adding them to our pastoral prayer today. There's no other announcements. I don't see Mary, Mary Ann or Eleanor jumping up to say anything. So in that case, we will have Deborah Lee come and minister us music, and then Ida will come and read scripture. Um, this morning, I'd like to sing a little bit about the sweetness of being a disciple of Jesus Christ and walking securely in his footsteps. No matter if we're in testing or trial, there's always an underlying triumph that we have as we're secure in him. I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to worship you. Oh, my soul, rejoice. Take joy, my King, in what you hear. May it be a sweet, sweet sound in your ear. Sweetly, Lord, we have heard you calling. Come, follow me. And we see where your footprints falling lead us to thee. Footprints of Jesus that make our pathway glow. We will follow the steps of Jesus wherever they go. Sweet, sorry. <clears throat> Sweet are the promises, kind is the word, dearer far than any message man ever heard. Pure is the mind of Christ, sinless I see. He the great example is the pattern for me. Where he leads I'll follow, follow all the way. Where he leads, I'll follow, follow Jesus every day. Sweet is the tender love Jesus has shown, sweeter far than any love that mortal has known. Kind to the erring one, faithful is he. He the great example is the pattern for me. Where he leads, I'll follow, follow everywhere. Where he leads, I'll follow, follow Jesus every day. List to his loving words, come unto me. Weary, heavy laden, there is sweet rest for thee. Trust in his promises, faithful and sure. Lean upon the Savior and your soul is secure. Where he leads, I'll follow, follow all the way. Where he leads, I'll follow, follow Jesus every day. Reading today from Mark 1, 29 to 45. As soon as they left the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they told Jesus about her at once. Jesus came, 
and took her by the hand and lifted her up. Then the fever left her, and she began to serve them. That evening at sunset, they brought to him all who were sick or possessed by demons, and the whole city was gathered around the door. And he cured many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons, and he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. In the morning, while it was still very dark, he got up and went out to a deserted place, and there he prayed. And Simon and his companions hunted for him. When they found him, they said to him, Everyone is searching for you. He answered, Let us go on to the neighboring towns, so that I may proclaim the message there also, for that is what I came out to do. And he went throughout Galilee, proclaiming the message in their synagogues and casting out demons. A man with a skin disease came to him, begging him, and kneeling, he said to him, If you are willing, you can make me clean. Moved with pity, Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I am willing, be made clean. Immediately the skin disease left him, and he was made clean. After sternly warning him, he sent him away at once, saying to him, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go, show yourself to the priests, and offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded as a testimony to them. But he went out and began to proclaim it freely, and to spread the word, so that Jesus could no longer go into a town openly, but stayed out in the country, and people came to him from every quarter. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Thank you, Ida, and uh, thank you, Deborah Lee, for your ministry of music amongst us today. It's uh, now time for our prayers of the people with the Lord's Prayer. We're going to remember the um, Debbie Hutchinson and her family and her prayers today, as well as Charmaine and Gary Murray. Charmaine was moved to palliative care this week, so um, we'll keep them in our thoughts. Let us pray. Lord God, we come before you in prayer trusting that your power works in the world in ways we cannot even imagine, calling goodness forward, supporting love, and creating justice even in situations that seem hopeless to us. Draw on our prayers as signs of your spirit at work in our lives. God of the world and all its people, we pray today for those who lift up their voices in troubled nations, for those working to bring justice and negotiate peace for those bringing aid to the vulnerable, and those offering shelter to anyone fleeing violence. God of everyday lives, we pray today for our community and our neighbors whose everyday lives have been disrupted over these last two years of the pandemic and by economic realities beyond their control. Inspire leaders to combine compassion with good planning and consider the needs of all those who feel desperate. God of neighborhood and nation, we pray for friends and neighbors far, near and far, for all who travel this summer, and for those who find themselves strangers in new com- communities. We remember those in our hearts facing challenges this day. We think of Charmaine and Gary Murray, and we lift them up before you and leave Charmaine in your care as the great healer. We think of Debbie Hutchinson and her family and the loss of their mother, June Bridge. Please bring them comfort during these times. Draw near to each one in need, in deep need, O God. Equip us to support those lives that intertwine with ours, for we are your people, embraced by your love. We continue to pray together now with the words Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our next hymn is number 203. Very appropriately, when Jesus the healer passed through Galilee. remain standing while we have the prayer of dedication for the offering, followed by the doxology. Dear Lord, we thank you for the opportunity we have to return to you a small portion of the ways and means in which you bless and enrich our lives. May these tithes and offerings be used for the extension of your word and the continuation of your work, both in this community and around the world. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
<laughs> um, we're doing the scripture readings in a little reverse order, so you read my piece this morning. No, that's okay, Ida. So I'm going to be covering uh, the one Ida's was uh, six, chapter 1, 16 to 28, reading from the new uh, revised standard version. As Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me, and I will make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. And he went a little further. He saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in their boat mending their nets. And immediately he called them, and left, they, they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. They went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, he entered the synagogue and taught. They were astounded at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority, and not as the scribes. Just then, there was in, the, in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, what have, you, what have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent, and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him, and crying with a loud voice, came out of him. They were all amazed, and they kept on asking one another, What is this? A new teaching with authority? He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. At once his fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. Is that it? Yes, that's it. This is the word of our Lord. Uh, our next hymn is number 634, Will You Come and Follow Me?
please be seated. And thank you, Seamus, for your musical playing with us today. Uh, that was a beautiful hymn, so much appreciated. Let us pray. Eternal God, we understand the purpose of your word is to be a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. As we hear it read and proclaimed, give us grace to perceive your truth, willingness to walk in its light, and in Jesus' name we ask, amen. Two of the most well-known Christians of our age were Mother Teresa and Billy Graham. We both know of them. Mother Teresa founded the Missionaries of Charity. It was a Roman Catholic religious congregation, consisted of over 4,500 nuns and active in some 130 countries. The congregation manages homes for people who are dying of HIV AIDS, leprosy, and tuberculosis. It also runs soup kitchens, dispensary, mobile clinics, children and family counseling programs, as well as orphanages and schools. The vow of its members is to give wholehearted free service to the poorest of the poor. Mother Teresa died in 1997. Now Billy Graham, who is an American evangelist, prominent evangelical Christian figure and ordained Southern Baptist minister. And of course, we all know he became well known internationally in the late 1940s. One of his biographers has placed him among the most influential Christian leaders in the 20th century. As a preacher, he held large indoor and outdoor rallies with sermons that were broadcast on radio and television, and some were even being rebroadcast into the 21st century. He died in 2018. Now, question for you. Which of these two do you think best emulates Jesus? Which reflects the best of what Jesus asks of us? Is it Billy Graham or is it Mother Teresa? Well, you think about it a bit, put it on the back burner and let it simmer for a while. We'll come back to them in a bit. But right now we're going to go back in history, some 2,000 years, back to Mark's Gospel. We started it last week. Remember it had the sense of urgency to it. Part of it is the message itself. From the last line we read last week, verse 15, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. It sort of leads you to an expectation of immediate fulfillment, doesn't it? When is the other shoe going to drop? Soon, it's got to be pretty soon. And p- part of it could have been the times when it was written. Probably written in Rome, during the time of Nero's reign, that was 54 to 68 AD, which included periods of intense persecutions of Christians. There is much historical speculation that Nero placed the blame for Christians for starting the great fire of Rome in 64 AD. Why did he do that? That was to counter the persistent rumor that he actually started it. It was part of an urban renewal scheme. He needs to clear some land for a new palace. Let's just start a little fire. He needed some 300 acres. Got a bit out of hand. Burnt down two thirds of the city. So if you made a boo-boo like that, what would you do? Blame the Christians for your big mistake. Also, two of the church's most prominent individuals, Peter and Paul, they were being held captive in Rome. They were executed during Nero's reign. Peter was crucified upside down. Paul was beheaded and buried outside the walls of the city. No, it was not a good time to be a Christian in Rome. And what appeared at roughly the same time? Circulating amongst the surviving Christians, a small book, Mark's Gospel, The Good News, written to remind them of Jesus, the Messiah, God's suffering servant, who died for the sins of the world, but was resurrected from the dead. It was written to encourage Jesus' followers, giving them hope, and urging and guiding them in cross-bearing discipleship, or in simpler terms, what it, mean, what it means to follow Jesus, and it was written with a sense of urgency. And also contributing to the sense of urgency is Mark's writing style. There's this very staccato sequence of events 
in this first chapter that we read. Things happen in rapid fire. It's almost like you're watching a slideshow. You know one of those old slideshows? But the person advancing the slides has had one too many coffees this morning and we're just going a little too fast. Much different writing style from Matthew, Luke, and John. And they're often bare bone description of events. For example, the temptation of Jesus in the wilderness after his baptism. We read it last week, you remember? Two verses. If you nodded off for a second, and I'm sure none of you did, you would have missed it. In Matthew's Gospel, that same event is 11 covered in 11 verses. In Luke, it's 13 verses. Way, way more detail. Not Mark, he likes to get to the point. So that rapid fire series of events, the fast-moving slideshow, we, we see that the rest of the verses from chapter 1 we read today is the description of Jesus' early ministry. And what do we see? We have Jesus calling disciples, driving out demons, healing the sick, including Peter's mother and leper, taking time to pray, and going on a preaching tour of Galilee, and announcing that all this has to do with the coming of God's rule, with the, chap with the chapter ending with, and people came to see him from every quarter. Things got really busy for Jesus in a hurry, very, very quickly. And we're still in chapter 1. It's also interesting to reflect on the broad range of activities that are included in Jesus' ministry. Recruiting disciples, healing, preaching, and teaching. Sort of a combination of, and you can bring them back up from the back burner now, Billy Graham when Jesus is preaching, and Mother Teresa when he is healing. But then in verse 38, that I had read, Jesus clearly states his main goal when Simon and his companions finally track him down and tell him that everyone was looking for him, and what does he have to say to them? Let us go on to the neighboring towns, so that they might proclaim the message there also, for that is what I came out to do. Proclaiming the message, that's his priority. Jesus' reply shows that he feared that the healings, the exorcisms, were getting in the way of people understanding who he really was, what he was really about, getting in the way of them hearing the message. The people of Capernaum were becoming more interested in him as a miracle worker, so Jesus decided it was time to move on. I led off today with scripture from Matthew, the last verse of his gospel. It's often referred to as the Great Commission, where just prior to ascending to heaven, Jesus directs the disciples to go therefore and make disciples of all nations. In other words, spread the news. That's what Jesus was asking, was commissioning them to do. And it's very misleading to suggest that Jesus' ministry focused on serving, that every moment of his time was spent with the poor, sick, helpless, and hurting. It may sound heartless, but it's true. It simply was not Jesus' main goal to heal the sick and meet the needs of the poor. He was sent in the world to save people from condemnation. In the Bible, there is not a single example of Jesus going into town with a stated purpose of healing or casting out demons. Not once do we see him sitting down with the disciples early in the morning saying, here's the plan for the day, guys. First we'll start with the lepers, then we'll move on to the blind. Yes, Jesus certainly did a lot of healing along the way. He was moved with pity at human need. But the reason he came out was to preach, teach, and proclaim the good news. So more like Billy Graham and less like Mother Teresa, Mother Teresa perhaps. Yes, probably. Eh? But hold on. Now I'm confused. Then why are there so many examples of healing, casting out demons, healing, feeding large crowds in the Bible. All four Gospels, so many examples of dealing with the sick, the poor, the downtrodden. Yes, Jesus was moved by human suffering. He couldn't stand by and do nothing. And yes, the healing and miracles demonstrate that Jesus is the Son of God. But why are they so integral to the storyline of Jesus? Do Jesus' actions speak louder than his words? 
Do all the acts of healing and kindness contradict his message that his main goal is to spread the message? And that great commission, if the disciples' job was to go spread the word to all nations, why does the Holy Spirit endow them with healing powers? We see that in Acts chapter 3, where Peter heals a crippled beggar. You remember in chapter 2 at Pentecost, Peter was preaching. You come to chapter 3 in Acts, Peter is healing. <laughs> where does this take us all? I think Mark's slideshow here in chapter 1 does have a larger, overreaching message. By covering in quick succession the various ways that Jesus ministers, the preaching, the healing, the casting of demons, the praying, and so on. By doing this, Jesus is demonstrating that these are all valid ministries. All serve notice that God's reign is here. If proclamation of the good news is a priority, as it seems to be in verse 38, that is not because the other ministries are less valid, but because Jesus' proclamation explain, explains both the need for the other ministries and their significance. In other words, saying that the kingdom of God has come is one thing, and demonstrating what it looks like is quite another. In other words, saying that the kingdom of God has come is one thing, and demonstrating what it looks like is quite another. And Jesus does both in spades. So, Billy Graham, Mother Teresa, yes, both roles are valid. The holistic ministry of Jesus, this broad range of activities, calls us to see all human need as God's concern, whether the need is for protection and justice, comfort and support, hope and meaning, or salvation and eternal life. In short, love thy neighbor as thyself. So what do you do with this, either as an individual Christian or as a church? Well, Paul gives us a good insight in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 under the heading, One Body and Many Members. Everybody knows it quite well, where he tells us, Now you are a body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. And God has placed in the church, first of all, apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, of helping, of guidance, and of different tongues. In other words, we each have different strengths, different skills. In God's kingdom, we, we are not all expected to be doing the same thing. We can't all be Billy Graham or Mother Teresa's. But as I said last week, big or small, we all have a role to play somehow. And as a church, yes, our priority as with Jesus is to proclaim the message, which we do each week. Some weeks that's better than others, perhaps. As to other ministries, I get the idea of some things you're involved here at First Presbyterian, from the bulletins, the various items that are posted around the church. Back at First Baptist, there's also a range of things going on, from mission support, benevolent funding for needy community members, now the Summer Sunday Supper program, the Big Give, supporting the food bank, supporting loaves and fishes. You get the idea. And some of our members are involved in this, but not that, and that's okay. And each church, no doubt, is involved in different ende endeavors and in different ways, and that's okay too. Because what Mark's description of Jesus' wide ministry tells us, that these are all valid causes, all valid ministries, all part of work in God's kingdom. And that is the beauty of the twofold message of Mark's gospel. The same twofold message to those early Christians of the first century as it is to us today. By giving an account of the things Jesus says and the things Jesus does, Mark is first making it clear, as Jesus himself said, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. And he's also making it clear as to what being a disciple is all about, making it clear what following Jesus is all about. Discipleship, 101. What is expected of us as Christians? And no, we can't cure someone with leprosy as Jesus did. We can't raise someone from the dead. We will probably never create as huge a serving ministry as Mother Teresa did, or be as famous a preacher as Billy Graham was. Well, I know I won't be. 
But Mark is telling us that there are many ways in which we, as individuals and as churches, spread the good news as well as address human need and suffering. Many ways in which we can love our neighbor and many ways which we can all have a role in God's kingdom. Thank you. Please take your hymnals and our final hymn today. As soon as I get there, someone help me out. Oh, number 571, Lord, I want to be a Christian. Speaking of discipleship. Go in peace, love and care for one another in Christ's name, and may God bless you with every gift needful for his work. May the Spirit grant you the willingness to risk yourself completely for the sake of the gospel, and may the love and the compassion and the hope and the faith of Jesus dwell richly within you until the time of his coming, both now and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>